morning, Cypher Christian Church. Uh, welcome this morning to the service. Um, wish I was there to see you face to face. I really miss worshiping with you guys um, on Sunday mornings. I hope you're well. I hope your your families are doing well and you're holding up during this this time of, of isolation. Um, I really encourage you guys this morning uh, to to try to lift up your worship and participate. I know it's uh, really easy just to kind of sit and watch, but I really encourage you guys, like we do on Sunday mornings, to lift your voices and to really participate in the worship this morning. Um, again, miss you, and uh, wish we were all there together. Um, this morning we wanted to open up with a call to worship out of Psalm 46. So I have some helpers. Beckett. Psalms 46, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help us help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the, the, of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos, and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders, and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes war wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored in every, by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Amen. So we're going to lead you guys, uh, do our best in leading you guys in some worship songs this morning. So um, I'm going to have my, the rest of my family come up and we're going to give it a go. So I encourage you guys, like I mentioned, to really participate and um, Join us in this song. I think you'll know it. Um, okay, ready, guys? Come on in, Jackson. All right, we got some instruments. And, uh, babe, um, can you... Can you get in here, Jackson? Um, babe, can you... Uh, where are you, sis? There we go. Now everybody's in. Babe, can you get us started with a beat? There we go. There we go, Jackson. try. That was a really good effort that you gave it, and I'm sure with a little bit more practice, you guys are going to nail it next week, so we'll come back to you. Um, we're going to begin with worship here this morning and, uh, and sing our first song, Hosanna, which I think is has probably never been more appropriate, uh, these lyrics, than they are today. So we invite you to join with us and sing wherever you are.
Good morning, Cy Fair Christian Church. My name is Ira Wiesel, and I'm one of the directors here at the church. And on behalf of the directors, we wanted to bring a little bit of a financial update uh, at this time during the offering meditation to let everybody know where things stand from on church finances. Uh, we are very pleased to report that in the month of March, there was a slight surplus for the month. Um, there's also a surplus for the year to date uh, through the first quarter of about $6,000 and we're very pleased to be able to share that information with you. Uh, we do understand that uh, April and the coming months may have some challenges, uh, but we're uh, looking forward to uh, helping our church families with online giving, which many of you are familiar with. In fact, uh, we currently have about 60% of our families that give online, uh, including 14 new families that started giving online uh, during the month of March. Uh, so we're, we're excited about that. Um, we also have, Dale and the staff have worked really hard and been very proactive in reducing our operating expenses uh, since we're not meeting on campus at the building. Uh, we've cut some expenses and stopped some service providers in order to keep our expenses down at this time. Uh, and that, in part, helped contribute to the surplus in the month of March. We also understand that we have uh, families that have lost jobs and lost income, and that will be difficult in the coming months for those families to meet their obligations, both personally and uh, their church commitments that they've made. Um, there are some folks who haven't been impacted very significantly. We also understand that there are some folks who are fortunate and might have the ability to make some additional contributions uh, to help and support the church where that first group uh, is not able to do so. So we ask that you uh, think about that and pray about that and see what God would have you do uh, with the church at this time. Um, so let's uh, pray for our offering. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunities that you provide to us um, to help people in this time of need. Uh, God, we uh, pray for our nation we pray for our leaders and the decisions that are being made in these difficult times. Uh, God, we pray that you would keep our eyes and our ears open as we uh, hear about opportunities and see opportunities to um, provide assistance to people and to be the hands and feet of Jesus as you've asked us to do. Um, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Triumphal Entry Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethlehem, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and you will immediately find a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophets, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spreaded their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spreaded them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and, and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna, the son of David. Blessed 
is he who's come in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? Hey guys, I thought I'd take this opportunity on this very special Palm Sunday to come to you uh, from a special place. You know, I really look forward to the day uh, when we all gather in this place together. Uh, I miss you guys. I miss your faces. Uh, I miss handshakes. And unlike Kevin, I, I even miss your hugs. Today, we're going to continue um, our journey in the Sermon on the Mount entitled Counter Culture. Again and again, each passage we look at, we find Jesus setting cultural norms for the kingdom of God. Uh, we are part of God's kingdom as followers of Jesus. Our lives are to be different than this world in which we live. Jesus Christ will change us as we walk in relationship with him. You know, I think about uh, this passage, a passage that deals with retaliation and also deals with uh, loving your enemy. And I think about, again, that triumphal entry I think about people shouting, laying down palm branches, waving palm branches, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King. Many of the people in that crowd, just a few days later, would be shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And yet as we watch our Lord, our Savior, our King, as we watch his actions and watch his words, we see an incredible example of how we are to respond when we're not treated right, how when we're to respond when we're accused falsely, how we're even to respond to our enemies. I'd like to read to you from Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 38. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who 
persecute you. It's an incredible passage. It's a challenging passage. And just like the passage last week, it seems an, an impossibility to live out that command to do not be anxious. To love your enemy? That seems like an unreal challenge. Let's look at what Jesus has to say. Let's look at this passage historically and, and let's look at it, these three life examples that, that Jesus shares. First of all, there are some key words in this passage and, and they're words many of you have quoted and quite honestly, they might be the most quoted words in the Sermon on the Mount. They're often misquoted, by the way. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I've heard that many, many times. I've heard that from followers of Jesus and non-followers of Jesus. But those words are not the words that have caused such controversy. These words are, do not resist the one who is evil. Those very words have changed the course of many groups, many religious groups, those words have inspired um, pacifism among many people. Um, the um, Russian um, man by the name of Leo Tolstoy, um, he took these words and he interpreted these words to mean that a follower of Jesus could not be a judge in the court system, that a follower of Jesus could not be um, a government official, that a follower of Jesus could not serve in a police force, and that a follower of Jesus should not serve in the armed forces. I mean, he took these literal. He did not just apply them to individuals. He implied them, applied them to government and to institutions. Do not resist. The one who is evil. Well, guys, just like many phrases in God's word and, and passages in God's word, the context is critical. If you pull that one phrase out of this context, you could arrive at Tolstoy's um, conclusions. But we're going to look at this passage in its context. Again and again, we hear Jesus say these words, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. Jesus did not come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law. But the truth of the matter is, oral teachers, the teachers of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees, they often misinterpreted the law. This, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, the, the command, the instruction was about preventing revenge from getting out of control. It was not a commandment to take an eye if an eye was taken. It was a restraining order on revenge. But that's not what the Pharisees were teaching. That's not what the teachers of the law, um, not how they interpret it. They were um, teaching this passage and they were instructing people to take an eye if an eye was taken. They were applying this in individuals' lives where the original passage was to be applied um, to the judges, to the wise men seeking to settle legal matters among the people of God. Let's look at the three examples um, Jesus gives. First of all, he gives an example that we've all heard of. Uh, he tells them, turn the other cheek. Now, here's the application for each life illustration. I'm going to give you a phrase, a phrase that is um, a matter of application. So turn the other cheek. What does that mean? Does that mean to get in a slugfest and someone is just punching you with every ounce of their energy and knocking you to the ground and you just stand up and say, hit me again. Give me your best shot. That is not what Jesus is teaching here. 
To turn the other cheek literally means to find your identity in Christ alone. You say, Dale, what are you talking about? Yes, uh, exactly what I said. Find your identity in Christ alone. Just watch this if you would. If you're facing me and I hit you on your right cheek, you're facing me and I punch you, I'd be hitting you on your left cheek, right? That's not what the passage says, and I think it's very intentional. For in this environment, in Jesus' day, the greatest insult you could make against someone is to take your hand and slap them backhanded into, what would it be? Their right cheek. This is still a great insult in many, many cultures today. When you slap someone, backhand someone into their cheek, you're telling them, you are inferior to me. Jesus says, do not allow them to determine your identity. You are a child of the king. You are part of the kingdom of God. You're a citizen of my kingdom. I am your king. So what I want you to do, I want you to not accept what they're telling you. I want you to stand and I want you to turn the other cheek. And let them know that they will not determine your value. They will not determine your worth. It's a strong passage. It's challenging. But what will we do when people insult us? Will we operate from insecurity and insult them as well? Will we play a, a one-upmanship? Will we re at, retaliate in an even greater way? That happens. When we operate in the flesh, it happens in our own lives. I pray that you would let no one determine your identity except Jesus Christ alone. The second illustration, it's a little more complicated, but Jesus says, if someone takes you to court and is suing you for your tunic, give him your cloak also. There's an Old Testament passage that says you can offer uh, your cloak. It was a very valuable thing. By the way, the cloak was very sacred. It's hard for us to even conceive it. But Jesus says, don't claim your rights. You could put up your cloak for collateral. But if you put up your cloak for collateral in a financial deal, they had to return your cloak that very evening. It was that important. It was your right. Jesus is telling this man, and, and I really think this is a figurative illustration that would have really hit home to the people in Jesus' day. He is telling them, when someone sues you for your tunic, do not claim your rights. Do not claw and scratch to get what is yours. Guys, we all have rights. And if we're not careful, claiming our rights in this world will actually undermine our ability to live for God's kingdom. People all around us are watching to see whether we're just like everyone else or whether Jesus Christ has truly made a difference in our life. The third life illustration, um, the third life illustration uh, has to do with going the second mile. Uh, we've heard this expression as well, turn the other cheek, go the second mile. Um, it was very common. Now remember, the people of Israel are a subjugated people. Um, they are under Roman rule. 
And so Roman soldiers would often pass through the territories that the Israelites predominantly lived in. It was the right of a Roman soldier to force anyone to carry his equipment one mile, but only one mile. He could get in trouble for forcing someone to carry his equipment two miles. But what does Jesus say? Jesus says, serve your enemy. Serve your enemy. Do not find your identity in those who insult you. Do not claim your rights when you are under attack, even in a court. But serve. Serve your enemy. Don't just fume and fret and, and figure out how you can get back at this person. You can't stand who is taking advantage of you. No, offer to carry his equipment two miles. Show him grace. Guys, I think you know, as followers of Jesus, we've been shown grace. Uh, thank goodness that God didn't retaliate um, when we failed, when we've rebelled, when we've chosen our way over his way. I'm so thankful for his grace and for his mercy. You know, Jesus um, sums up this mentality very well in a passage, Luke 9, 23 to 25. It really describes what it means, what it means to love your enemy, to lay down your life for others, to serve, serve our world for God's glory. Jesus said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. For whoever will claim his rights will lose them. For whoever will find their identity in others, especially those who insult them and humiliate them, will lose the value that God has given them. For everyone who will fume and fret and try to get back on those that are taking, um, get back at those who are taking advantage of you, um, you will lose the privilege. You will lose the experience of grace that all of us should know very well. Jesus said, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. We must give our life away. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Again, all of this could be summed up simply in love your enemies. Matthew 5, 43 through 44, we've already read it. Jesus said, again, you have heard that it was said. And, and by the way, what Jesus is about to quote is not in Scripture in this format. Again, the scribes, the teachers of the law, um, the Bible doesn't say to hate your enemy, but look at how they did not leave it just at love your neighbor. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And so the guys, the real question, the real question is, is loving your enemy really possible? Can we live out this principle? Can we actually put into practice turning the other cheek, giving up our rights, 
showing grace to our enemies. Can we do that? I'll tell you quite honestly, no, not in our strength. We could never do it. We cannot conjure up the feeling nor the energy to do it. But when the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we experience the gospel and the gospel of Jesus Christ flows in us, God's power, God's spirit can and will enable us to accomplish the impossible. Our world is watching to see how we will respond. Guys, a minute ago I mentioned that we were once enemies, enemies of God. Paul writes, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? Of course we'll be saved by his life. We were enemies. We were brought into relationship. We were reconciled with God through the death of Jesus Christ. In a moment, I want to encourage you to take part in communion at home. I, I know this is different. But I tell you, if you would, just serve communion to each other. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. We've been reconciled with God. We who were once enemies because of God's grace. There was a man who practiced these principles um, to the extreme. His name was Martin Luther King Jr., Listen to this quote. Why should we love our enemies? The first reason is fairly obvious. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate. Adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate multiplies hate, violence multiplies violence, and toughness multiplies toughness in a descending spiral of destruction. But there is another side which we must never overlook. Hate is just as injurious to the person who hates. Like an unchecked cancer, hate corrodes the personality and eats away its vital unity. Hate destroys a man's sense of values and his objectivity. It causes him to describe the beautiful as ugly and the ugly as beautiful and to confuse the true with the false and the false with the true. You see, Martin Luther King Jr. was an example of loving your enemy because he knew the one who perfectly loved his enemy. Before we take communion, listen to these words. One, a prophetic word from Isaiah. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Isaiah 56. Listen to Mark 14, verse 65. And some began to spit on him and cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. On the cross, and Jesus said, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Guys, what we see here is a strong man. A determined man. A man of grace. 
a meat man, power under control. He didn't strike back. He didn't spit back. He didn't make demands of his rights. But he took on the form of a servant and gave up his life. He died on a cross that we might be made right with God. Guys, I encourage you, none of us are perfect. All of us struggle. Many of us this morning have broken relationships that need to be addressed. Guys, I encourage you, turn the other cheek, give up your rights. Don't allow others to determine your identity. Find your identity in Christ. Go the second mile. Demonstrate the grace of God even to your enemies. The world is watching. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your goodness. Father, right now as we prepare our hearts for communion, I ask that as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we would be reminded of our example, Jesus Christ, that we would be reminded of the incredible price he paid that we might become your children. Father, we love you. I thank you for your people gathered today across this community, gathered in worship. We are your body. We're scattered now, but Father, we look forward to the day we will be gathered in this place. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we thank you for joining us for our live stream here uh, today. We hope that you've been encouraged by the worship. We hope you've been encouraged by the message and you've been encouraged with one another. It's no substitute for being in the same place at the same time, but it's what we have right now and we want to make the best of it. So we encourage you guys when you're on these live streams to say hello to one another, to, um, to share your prayer requests with one another, just as you would if we were in the physical space. Um, that said, we, we want to encourage you to share your prayer request at prayer at scifarechristian.org. We've already received a bunch of prayer requests this past week, and we encourage you guys to continue sending those in. Our pastors, our elders, and our prayer partners want to be praying for you, and so please send those along. Uh, also want to remind you that you can give easily three different ways. You can give by going to scifarechristian.org slash give, or you can use our mobile app, or you can text to give, and that number is at the bottom of our screen right now. And uh, super easy way to give, and we encourage you to continue doing that. Lastly, I want to remind you that next week is Easter, and um, it's sad that we're not going to be together. This is the first time that the American church has not 
been able to gather in a physical space on Easter Sunday, but we are still going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And I encourage you to, uh, to, to join us, to invite your friends. Just because we're worshiping virtually doesn't mean that you can't invite your friends. In fact, it's even easier. And it's, it's probably easier for them to join us as well. And so share it on Facebook. Um, email your friends. Uh, just do whatever you can to reach out to those folks around you. People during this time right now need the hope of Jesus. And they are never more open to the gospel of Jesus than they are right now. And so please invite them to worship along with us. We've got some fun things planned and we're excited about it. Lastly, we're going to close with one final song. And we encourage you wherever you are to join in with us as we sing.
praise the Lord that we have um, a church. Praise the Lord that we have Cypher Christian Church, that we have the full-time staff that we do that have been able to adapt so quickly in so many ways uh, to the environment that we now find ourselves in, this quasi-lockdown situation, um, which is so unusual for us. Um, I think you'll agree with me that uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to the staff for pulling this together in the way that they have, and I thank them for that. In terms of going out at the end of this service, I hope you've been encouraged by the praise and worship that we have participated in. Uh, you can go back and watch, watch this again and listen to the message again. You can go back and see previous weeks. We've been calling out, uh, the, the elders have shared um, lists of names and hopefully you've been contacted or had a message left for you uh, asking if there are any particular needs that you have. Don't be shy to reach out to the leadership for um, a chat, to tell us what's going on, to tell us about your needs, how we can pray for you specifically. And, uh, and let's continue to encourage each other. And uh, I'm so thankful for you. And again, I'm so thankful for the community that we are a part of. Numbers 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you and have a great week. Okay, here's a question. Do you believe you have a personal responsibility to share your faith? Surveys have shown that the overwhelming majority of you would answer yes. Okay, so what about this question? Have you shared your faith with anyone in the last six months? Surveys have shown that a majority of you would answer this question? No. I guess it's just not as easy as it seems, or at least as easy as we'd like it to be. Well, here's another question. How many times have you personally invited an unchurched person to church? Now this seems simple, right? And yet, Surveys tell us that almost half of you would answer zero. I mean, there are lots of reasons why we don't, right? Like, maybe it still feels a little awkward and uncomfortable. Or maybe we're just unsure how effective it is. Or we just expect to hear them say, well, no. Okay, so listen to this. When people are asked why they came to church in the first place, the vast majority of them say, I began attending because someone invited me. It wasn't the music or the pastor. It wasn't the childcare, the youth program, or the building. Although these are all great things, important and valuable things, the main thing that got most of you up and through that door the first time wasn't any of these. It was an invitation. Easter will be here soon. It's the perfect Sunday to share with others what your faith is all about. And it can all start with one more simple question. Want to come to church on Sunday? Let's change the stats and let God change hearts and lives this Easter. And let's start with something simple. An invitation.